Make a moccasin. We should have gotten most of it finished. Critical reader, this is your name up here. Yes, I want you to turn this in. Yes, I'm giving you credit for it. No, I'm not grading it for complete accuracy. This is not meant to be a burden on you. No, they're not peanut M&Ms. I detest peanut M&Ms. You are the critical reader. If you've ever done some kind of DBQ assignment, this is my version of that. Just don't like them, Captain. Although my mom loved them, like so, like whenever, whenever my mom and I would have M and M's, it would like she'd have her package and I'd have my package. Each passage below is followed by a number of questions. Circle the best answer or answer directly based on what is stated or implied in the passage. For free response answers, you will be graded based on the quality and content of your response. Nicomachus of Gereza was a mathematician who flourished at the end of the first century. The passages that follow are his opening comments about the mathematical arts at the beginning of his work, Introduction to Arithmetic. Lest you think I am making this up, I'm just going to show you. I pulled the book off my shelf. By the way, this is book 11 in the great book series when it was published in, what's the publication of this book? They change the number of the orders every so often. This was published in 1957, 1952. Was it the print, is that the printed date? I think so, yeah. Okay. Nicomachus, the bottom guy down there. Oh, there's my paper copy. Hang on. No, that's Apollonius. Hang on. I'll find Nicomachus. I want to show you where it comes from. Oh, that's a, that's a note from myself 10 years ago. Um, Apollonius. Nope, no, no, no. Come on. Come on, come on. Here we go. Introduction to Arithmetic. There's a nice little bio section. It's pretty good. Um, can you see my handwritten notes and stuff like that in there? Like I am, I am annotating as I go through. Have you been taught how to annotate your books? <laughs> There's the good stuff right there. Reading a great book is like having a conversation with the best minds in all of human history. Now, granted, it's a uh, it's kind of a one way conversation. Because the authors are probably dead. But um, you should talk back to them. You should converse with them. And they only give us their best ideas. All right. So, speaking of Pythagoras, on the definition of wisdom, Nicomachus says, He, speaking of Pythagoras, is more worthy of credence than those who have given other definitions since he makes clear the sense of the term and the thing defined. This wisdom he defined as the knowledge or science of truth in real things. What? Conceiving science to be a steadfast and apprehension of the underlying substance and real things, real things to be those which continue uniformly and the same in the universe and never depart even briefly from their existence these real thi what real things would be the things here's the key word immaterial by sharing in the substance of which everything else that exists under the same name and is so called is said to be this particular thing that exists Okay, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a risk. Take a risk. How do I do this now? How do I do this? Hang on. Uh, 
I am turning everyone's microphone on. Okay, here we go. Who would like to give an explanation of what Pythagoras is calling real things? Catherine raised a hand. Good. Go ahead, Catherine. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. How are you? Oh, no. It's echoing again. Oh, well, we'll do At our least best. You can hear me. Um, oh, I'm doing well. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, the, the definition of real things is that um, he kind of says it up there. It's the um, it's those things which continue uniformly and the same in the universe and never depart even brief briefly from their existence. And like what? they're the immaterial things. So basically, what was that? Like what? Name me something that doesn't ever change. Oh, like mathematics and things that are just kind of part of the world, like the what, true what about, things. That, what about my coffee cup? Is my coffee cup real according to Pythagoras? No. Sadly, it's not. I think you're correct. You, you, like there, Somebody's having a sword fight in the background where you're at. Oh, it's yeah, probably yeah, my little siblings. They're like, yeah. You have brothers well, and sisters that are they're... fighting with pots and pans or something? Well, my mom is in the kitchen making something, and then my siblings are playing with train tracks behind me. So, um, yeah. Thanks for joining us in, in the middle of the chaos. <laughs> well, thank you. Good. All right, go ahead and press mute. Anybody else want to comment on that? Raise your hand so I'll call on you. We can't have everybody talking at once. <sighs> yep. Which is funny because the uh, what Pythagoras's, if that's the plural, possess possessive, Pythagoras's idea of what is real is the opposite of what we have kind of in the modern world today. Pythagoras says the real world, the permanent things, the things that are eternal, are cannot be physical things. So mathematics, he says, is something real. It doesn't ever change. It's perfect. And um, continues never departing briefly from its existence. Hmm. Material things are not permanent. Material things, Pythagoras would say, according to the Greek philosophy of the forms, material things reflect the permanent things. What was it? Somebody said, like, the idea of a coffee cup is a permanent thing, a real thing, but the physical coffee cup isn't really real. That's kind of, like, oxymoronic. Isn't really real. How interesting. Do you realize that the, the, the current modern understanding of the physical world from a physics perspective seems to imply that the physical world itself is some kind of projection? That there's something more fundamental, deeper than the physical world? You aware of that? Yeah, like I'm glad somebody brought it up. No. You think the Matrix is something um, like, oh, that's just science fiction. No, actually, there there's some indications in modern, like quantum physics things that says that, no, the physical world with its atoms and electrons and protons and so forth like that, that's not, that's not the fundamental reality. There is a deeper fundamental, and I'm just being smaller. I mean that the reality that we live in is, in a sense, a digital projection. No, it's not 
fake, there's just something deeper. There's something more fundamental. And so the idea of the matrix that we're in, like our, what we perceive around this isn't really ultimately real. There's something more deeper that we're, that's beyond our dimensional ability to perceive. Yeah. So like, I don't know. Like, I think the matrix wasn't really written to make that point, but there's some profound physics implications in the matrix. Go back to what Pythag Pythagoras' understanding of what is real, I think, is perhaps more along the along the right track than, you know, what we thought was real 50 years ago. What does that What does that mean in the light of a Christian philosophy? Does Christianity say that the physical world is the ultimate measure of things that are real? What's the, what's the real you? Let's get down to the, the, the thing. What's the real you? Is the real you a physical thing? Your soul is the real you. When you die bodily, your body goes into the ground, are you in the ground? See, this is this is like what? How do we get off the subject so fast? No, this is on topic. Yeah. What does the Apostle Paul say about dying, believers that die? He says that absence from the body is to be present with the Lord. What do you mean absent from the body if the physical is all that there is of you? That's 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 contradictory. How can you be absent from the body when the body is you? Maybe not. Isn't this great? This is a mathematics class. What's going on? Finally, we're getting to the important questions. What is mathematics? A pagan Greek philosopher, Pythagoras, says that ultimate reality is not the physical world. Oh my goodness. What in the world? Okay. Therefore, if we crave for the goal that is worthy and fitting for man, and by man he means human beings, it doesn't just mean men, the males, namely happiness of life. Didn't we talk about that at the beginning of the school year? Like, why are you here? And this is accomplished by philosophy alone and by nothing else. And philosophy, as I said, means for us desire for wisdom. And wisdom, the science of the truth in things, didn't we talk about, like, how do you become happy? We talked about wisdom and virtue. Oh, my goodness. Um, and of things, some are properly so-called. Others namely share the name. It is reasonable and the most necessary to some of accidental qualities of things. Things, then, both those properly so-called and those that simply have the name, are some of them unified and continuous. Here we go. We're getting into some of the details now. There are some things who are unified and continuous, meaning that they are one individual thing. For example, an animal, the universe, a tree, and the like, which are properly and particularly called magnitudes, magnitudes. Others are discontinuous in a side-by-side -side arrangement, and as it were, in heaps, like a pile of things, which are called multitudes. Here's another, another word, multitudes, multitudes. A flock, for instance. A flock is made up of a bunch of individual birds. But a tree isn't. A tree is a single thing. A people, meaning like a group of people, like a tribe. A heap, a chorus, and the like. Ignacio, is this graded like a test, quiz, or homework? None of the above. It is seminar. It is meant to be experienced. It is not a burden I lay on your back and whip you towards the finish line and say, carry this load. It turns up percentage points. Well, it'll probably go in as an assignment. Mm. So, in paragraph three, what does Nicomachus claim as the goal that is worthy and fitting for mankind? Wealth and fortune? Satisfaction in one's job and family life? Happiness found in comfort and entertainment? Happiness found in philosophy and the desire for wisdom? Okay, now, see, this is where people kind of go astray. I'm telling you in paragraph three, 
what does Nicomachus claim? Students who are a little bit slackers will be like, oh, I, I think happiness is found in comfort and entertainment because that's what the culture tells you that you need in order to receive happiness. Am I right or am I right? People say, no, 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 no. Happiness is found in wealth and fortune. Isn't that what social media tells you that you need to be happy? Right? Liars. Satisfaction in one's job. Yeah. No, Nicomachus says that the goal that's fitting for people is this. How shall we achieve happiness? Philosophy and the desire for wisdom. Okay. Think about that. You, we think today that the problems that human beings face are like new to us. No, people have not changed. Human nature has not changed over thousands of years. If you if you wonder about things that like, what's the meaning of life? Other people have thought that same thought and had discussions about it. And the best of those conversations are recorded in the great books. In paragraph two, what does Pythagoras consider real things? Answer, A, B, C, 10. Catherine thinks real things are 10. Well, 10 is somewhat a divine number. <laughs> Major capital. Okay, Pythagoras, Pythagoras, golly. Pythagoras says real things are ideas, okay? The permanent things are ideas. But the modern world says things that have material substance that can be touched. Or there's another part of the modern world that says personal feelings or emotions are the only things that are real. There's a philosophy out there that says that. It's not the first time humans have had that philosophy. Paragraph four, what's the difference between magnitudes and multitudes? All right. So this is important. What do you say? Magnitudes and multitudes. Here we go. A. A magnitude is one thing, and numbers tell us how big the one thing is. A multitude is many things, and this tells us how many? Have we talked about this before? Yes. Okay. What two things do numbers tell us? How many or how big? This class is all a setup. Yep. Where do you think I got the ideas from? Not from any math textbook I've ever read, although these ideas are embedded in math textbooks because ultimately this is not just me just taking Nicomachus's, Nicomachus's word for it. This is what these things really are, okay? This is discrete and continuous numbers. I've never seen any of this though spelled out in a math textbook. We start at the beginning. It's like, it's like trying to do the alphabet in order, but you start at like J and you kind of have to like, you have to do some work to go backwards to find A, B, and C. I do need to write a book. When do I have time to do that? I'm, I haven't even graded your test yet. <laughs> you feel my pain. A magnitude has many small parts and the multitude is a single whole. No, that's reversed. Okay. I might. I've done that in the past. There, is, there have been points in the past I just said, look, this is this is small enough. I need to focus on the big things. I'm just like, if you turn it in, you get 100%. Not for a test, though. But hang on. Um, do you see my capital letters here, one and many? Okay. In the front of the great book series is a list of all the authors and which book they're in. So we are in book 11. Find book 11 there. Where is it? There we go. Euclid, Archimedes, Apollonius, Nicomachus. There we go. Book 11. Here's all the different authors. In the back cover of the great book series are the hundred 
great ideas in alphabetical order, okay? Angel, animal, aristocracy, art, astronomy, beauty, being, cause, chance, change, citizen. These are all the, this, this is a list of the 100 biggest ideas, the, the great ideas that human beings have had discussions about since the dawn of human history. Do, whoops, other side. Do, 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 do. you see one and many there? One and many. The idea of the one and the many is not just a mathematical consideration. It shows up in several other areas as well. It is a philosophical topic. It is a tensioned topic. There's a tension between the one and the many, but there's also a synthesis as well. We see this in the American political philosophy. E pluribus unum is the, what, our, our national motto? Out of many, one. America is a nation founded not on ethnicity, not on tribalism, not on geography even. It's out of ideas and values. What do you have to be to be an American? White, black, Hispanic, Asian. Um, do you have to be born in America, like in this geographical area? No. What does it take for you to become an American? Agree to the ideas and values. That's not without conflict, right? But how do you how do you make one people out of many? It's the ideas and values that are important, not ethnicity, and not geographical location. People that come over here from Turkey within one generation can become an American, and they're just as American as everybody else, and we accept them as Americans. Think about that. If you did the reverse, if you went back over to Turkey, how long would it be for you to, be, to become Turkish? Probably never. Even after multiple generations, you'd still be seen maybe as an outsider because Turkey has a different idea about what it means to be Turkish. So like the one and the many, how do you balance the rights and privileges of the individual against the rights and privileges of the many? Oh, you see this in like how we set up our legislature? How do you balance states' rights versus federal rights? How do you balance big population groups versus small population groups? These, do you see how our founding fathers tried to set up a, a system whereby the tension is felt in perfect balance between the one and the many? Do we just say majority rules? No, then you trample on the rights of the one. Do we just say that the majority doesn't matter? No, because at some level, the many do matter. The major Why should the minority dictate to the majority? Oh my goodness. Might I propose to you that the, that the greatest expression of the tension between the one and the many is held in the Christian philosophy of the Trinity? Does God express his nature as one yet many? Where's the, where's the, where's the balance of that? Is there, a, is there some kind of a tension there between those two things, but yet a synthesis of those? Oh my goodness. <laughs> what? I'd like to move on, but I can't find my Apple Pencil. <laughs> Where did it go? <laughs> hmm. There it is. See, I win. Every time I misplace something, I'm playing hide and seek with myself. And I either win at finding or I win at hiding. So I'm always a winner. How is Pythagoras's comment of what is real different from the modern concept? Does anybody want to read their answer that they that they put down there? You can you can raise your hand. I'll call on you. You can have the microphone. All right, go ahead, Catherine. Okay, um, so this is what I wrote down, and I know that you were kind of hinting about something that the modern world is actually realizing that there's something else to the physical world, and I actually didn't 
take that into account. But I wrote that um, Pythagoras seems to base his definition, and surely the better definition, on the long term of life, and he paints real things as those that are not merely faint and passing things, but those that have existed and always will exist. Today, or at least I think my version of today, is that we only see real things as those we can materially sense, but that pass away from us um, and are of this world only. That's really good. There's no right or wrong answer for this. I'm just really, I'm just, it's, it's in the discussion. The value in this is in the discussion. Now, Catherine, I have to ask, is there any quieter room in the house that you can go to? Because I feel for you, like, I don't know how I would be able to concentrate with people having a pot stand fight behind me. I'll just, it's... It might, it might just be louder over the microphone, because um, it's not actually okay. that loud. So. Okay. I don't really know what's happening, but yeah, I can go. I was just in my head during your answer, not because I disagree with what you were saying. I was just like, how in the world does she even think with all of that racket going on? Well, yeah, I have eight. <laughs> Simon said the revolution is still in progress, I hear. I, I thought for a moment he was talking about the American Revolution because we were talking about American political theory. No, I think he meant like whatever kind of war was going on in the background in your house, Catherine. You must have a really strong and disciplined mind to be able to process through all of that. No, 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 don't apologize. Like, honestly, look, you're in the house with your family. The, the family is somewhat of a tension between the one and the many. But there should be a balance there as well, right? Mm. So good. So and enjoy your your younger brother and sister while they're there, even if they annoy you from time to time. It's it's okay. There's a goodness there. So anybody else want to answer? Is Lucy finally showing up? Lucy. Lucy, are you there? <clears throat> Glad you made it. Are you just joining us or did you get kicked off for some reason? And the microphones are hot, so you'd like you could answer in person if you want. Wi Fi. Okay, so glad you moved. All right. <laughs> it's okay. All things concrete are not real. No, I would say the physical world is real, but it's not ultimate reality. So, um, yeah, you know, if you, I don't know, if if you hit somebody over the head with a hammer and say, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna take your wallet, like, is that okay? Because the physical world is not real, therefore it doesn't matter. I would say no. That, that the physical world is real. But there is a there is a more deeper reality than the physical world. I would say mathematics speaks to that. I would say mathematics speaks to that more than any other subject. Like there was a book I read years ago by uh, James Nickel, N-E-C-K-E-L, not L-E. And it was called Mathematics Is God Silent? And his argument in that book was that mathematics more than any other subject spoke to the existence and nature of God. People think mathematics proves that God doesn't exist. Oh, no, I think the opposite is true. I think mathematics more than any other subject speaks to the theism. Because why is it true that all of these things, these mathematical principles, which at their essence are not physical, right? You understand that mathematics in the end is not just physical things, although it is seen in physical things like three ducks and two ducks is five ducks. But three and five is uh, three and two is five, even if you don't have any physical things. And isn't that what we're doing in this class, as we're discussing permanent, unchangeable ideas, and I have access to it with my mind, and you have access to it with your mind, and we can agree on these things, and when we don't agree, there's something amiss, and we need to sort it out, and hopefully in the end, we do come to it, and we, we all see. 
like how does my mind have access to mathematics and the, my brain's not physically connected to your brain with a cord or something like that how how are we how are we sharing thoughts we must we must both be tapping into something more permanent and deeper that's above us where does that come from and that is Rene Descartes I think therefore I am did we talk about this have we talked about this before Rene Descartes I think therefore I am statement that is his first step in the mathematical suspicious quotation marks mathematical proof for the existence of God and I have never heard anybody else talk about that they've talked all kinds of stuff about Rene Descartes and I think therefore I am like I've heard preachers talk about oh he's claiming that he's God and I was like no I, you know that was a bad move Rene like come on finally I went back and I read it and I was like oh snap no he's not claiming to be God at all it's his first step in a mathematical proof for the existence of a divine being because it's in his book discourse on method and he's he's talking about a new method a math a mathematical method and he thinks it can cover all he thinks it can explain all truth using this method and so he knows somebody's going to ask well you know give us an example give us a demonstration renee of um how your new method can answer questions that up until now have not been answered very well. And what do you think Renee's going to answer? What's the most pressing question of all of humanity, perhaps? Like, is there a God? Like, he doesn't he doesn't even go medium level difficulty. He goes for the throat. <laughs> he, I'm going to I'm going to show you my, how my method works by tackling the biggest question that humans maybe could ever ask at all. He goes for the top. And so his I think, therefore, I am statement is his first step in a mathematical proof for the existence of God. Don't miss the point. He's using mathematics to do it. He's not using theology. It's not a theological argument. It's a mathematical one. You should read it. It's compelling. At the end of the proof, he says, and if you still don't believe about, if you still don't believe me about the existence of God and of the existence of your own soul, I just want you to realize that you're, there's less proof for the sky and the trees and the ground and the things that you claim are real. <laughs> oh my goodness. People have rejected Rene Descartes' proof. Hmm. Can you repeat that my mom called me? That my mom called me. There you go. Oh no, watch the video. We gotta move on. How much time we got left? Like this is gonna take two or three class periods. Back page. Second page, second page, second page. All right, this part up here is nice. I'll let you dig into that. I want to dig into this right here. All right, so let's get into some details now. He says, um, <laughs> to deal with the idea of quantity. Remember previously, he's talking about quantity, right? Remember quantity? Quantity would be multitude. That's how many. What, what discipline deals with, deals with quantity? Arithmetic. Here we go. Arithmetic. Absolute quantity. What's the other thing that deals with quantity? Music. Music deals with relative quantity. Are you catching this? He says there's two things that you can study that teaches you about quantities, which answers the question, how many? How many? Quantities. Arithmetic, music. What is arithmetic? Absolute quantity, which means the properties of numbers just themselves. Okay? Music. Music deals with numbers, but not with themselves. 
relative to each other. Now, he doesn't mean music the way we modernly use that word, which just is exclusively sound. He's really talking about the muses, right? Remember, he's he's a Hellenistic Greek, or we're in the Roman world. He's in Alexandria, about 100 AD, right? So he's talking about all the muses. It's not what's going on in music, poetry, sound, sculpture, art, whatever you want to call the fine arts, that sort of thing. Is it's the harmonious relationship between things or not? Okay. And if you've done any kind of music theory, you might know something about harmonic ratios. I wish I could get into Galileo talking about that. So good. He's talking about the pendulum. Harmonic ratios, right? That like what what are some harmonic ratios? Like it's some something three fifths? There's something three three to five. Three to five is a harmonic ratio, right? Am I wrong? I took a music theory class in high school. Didn't do very well on it. Didn't have a background knowledge. Isn't isn't a three to five ratio a harmonic ratio? I see people typing, but then nothing's coming up, so I'm 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 worried we're stalling and we're wasting time. Yeah. Something like that. The thing about harmony is it's not just a single note. It's not a note. It's how a note compares to another note. Have you ever noticed that some notes sound good together and other notes sound kind of dull, but then some other notes like sound really kind of like strange. You don't like them. Right? Have you noticed how harmony or discord plays itself out in movie soundtracks? I... I remember watching like it was like a suspenseful movie or sometime like um, back in high school. And I said, my, maybe my mom was watching me. We were watching. We would watch old black and white movies, classic movies that on Saturday nights. But we're watching some movie and I just like I knew something. I knew something like scary was going to happen. I was like, watch, somebody's going to jump out from behind or stuff, scare him or something like that. And I thought I was being like really kind of like magically intuitive about the whole thing. And my mom says, that's because they're playing stressful music. I was totally unaware of it. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm being emotionally manipulated by the soundtrack? Oh, my goodness. There's a couple college kids that back in the, in, the, in the early 2000s, they did like a project where they took horror movies and they redid the soundtrack to make them sound like really kind of happy, cappy, you know, campy kind of movies or something changes the entire like there's no dialogue it's just the, the the scene like from the shining or something like that and they put like a happy like camp song with the with the with the video script and it changes the entire mood and you realize it ain't the video that you're watching that's doing that it's the music right mm. all right and once more in as much as part of size here we go with size size, size is the next thing Okay, that's how big is in a state of rest and stability. And another part is motion revolution. Two other sciences deal accurately with treat of size. Geometry, what does geometry tell us? Geometry tells us size at rest. And astronomy, astronomy is the last mathematical science. Size in motion. You ever seen this poster before? Okay. I made it. I designed it and put it together. It's my poster. I'm so proud of this. Grammar, logic, rhetoric. Those those are the trivium. I'm not I'm not really certain on on this. Like uh, people may argue with me. Like is grammar really the mechanics of language? Like I'm not sure. Is logic the mechanics of thought? I don't know. Is rhetoric the application of language and thought? I'd like it is. Like I'd like to get like Plato. Does Plato or Socrates explain what grammar, logic, and rhetoric are? Like I I I don't know where to go look. I can't find it. Okay. But this right here. The quadrivium, the mathematical arts, 
This is right from Nicomachus. This is right out of Nicomachus. Where do you think Marsh got these things? I didn't invent this. This came right out of Nicomachus. Arithmetic, absolute quantity. Music, relative quantity. Geometry, size at rest. Astronomy, size in motion. Size tells us how big. Arithmetic, whoops, not that. <laughs> Arithmetic tells us how many. Man, and they're in this order. And Nicomachus explains why arithmetic must come first and then music must follow it. it music can't come first. It's got to follow arithmetic. And you can't do geometry until you've had music and arithmetic. And astronomy has to be the one that's last. Like his, his arguments are great. According to paragraph five, what's the difficulty of studying math magnitudes and multitudes directly? Well, what's the answer? Yeah, A. He says the difficulty is, is that magnitudes and multitudes are, in the end, infinite. If you start with how big one thing is, he says you can theoretically break it into an infinite number of pieces. And so it's difficult then to arrive at the end when you study it directly. You've got to study things that show you that. In other words, you've, you've got to study it in the small little extension parts, then that leads you back to the big idea. What about multitudes? Well, if you start with one and start adding things to it, two, three, four, or start doubling things, like I've got one, and then I got two, and then I got four, and then I got eight, and then I got 16, that sort of thing. He says eventually it goes to infinity. And so the concept of infinity is out of reach, both big stuff and small stuff. Okay? Size can be infinitely divided. That's difficult to grasp. Multitudes can be intimately multiplied. That's difficult to grasp. And so you have to kind of study these things in the smaller little pieces of them. Magnitudes and multitudes can be studied through which two ideas? B, magnitude through size and multitude through quantity. And so it's by studying arithmetic and music and then geometry and astronomy that you can grasp quantity and or multitudes and magnitudes. According to chapter three, how is quantity studied? Quantity? How many? How many? Arithmetic and music? How is size studied? C. Geometry and astronomy? What's the difference between arithmetic and music, according to Nicomachus? A or B? Okay. Do you realize that these answers that are incorrect, these answers that are incorrect are bait for the student who hasn't read the work? Because if I asked you this last year, if I asked you this last year before we started to have our conversation, what's arithmetic and music? Wouldn't you probably say arithmetic is how to add numbers and music studies sound? Like, wouldn't that be the, the common response if you asked the man, hey, well, what do you think is Smith being <laughs> The above's more sophisticated. <laughs> Pick the longer. Okay. All right. I don't know what I don't know what to respond. I don't have a, I don't have a response to that like ready to go. I have to think about that a little bit. <laughs> you wonder why how many like, how many times has something come up and I've had like an immediate witty thoughtful response. It, I don't I don't think that quick. I've had 20 years to practice cuz you're not the first person to ask me that question. <laughs> I think later on the way home. Oh, that would have been a great response. I'm going to write that down for next year. My, 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 my. Let's put that away. Save that for next year. I haven't thought about that one yet. <laughs> hmm. Okay. What's the difference between geometry and astronomy? Geometry is size at rest. Okay. The study of the sizes of things, geometric figures that are not moving, they're just static, they're just sitting there, right? Astronomy, as it originally started out, was the study of like motion, things that are moving. 
right? And if you if you know the ancient view, the geocentric view of the world, like I mean by the world, I mean the universe, it was earth centered with the things revolving around them in circles. It was in, inter inter interlaced or interlocked spheres. And then you had things that would go around in a circle on a circle. So you had like epicycles and stuff like that. Yeah, music is not commonly thought of as a mathematical art. How might the concept of harmony be considered mathematical? All right. I'm curious what any else. Simon. 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 This, this, I think you should answer this question. Simon, aren't you the, aren't you the organer? So is Ignacio. All right, math fight between Ignacio and Simon about music. He says, my dad's calling me. How do I tell him to tell his dad to wait? Like that was a smooth move. I don't have a response for that either. I guess you got to take a phone call from your dad. He stepped away from the meeting. Maybe it's true. <laughs> oh, he says, not kidding. Okay, answer the phone call from your dad. That's um, that that's above me. Okay, all right. So Ignacio, you want to unmute your microphone and tell me how you answered this one? I'm curious. Because I wrote these questions. I did not write the material, but I wrote these questions. Ignacio sick. Oh, he's got a sore throat. All right, so I'll read your answer so we have it on record, at least verbally. I'll do my best radio announcer voice. I have to laugh at myself. Like, did you see my face? My M&Ms are all gone, and I thought my coffee was more gone than it was. So I just assumed my coffee was almost gone, and I tipped my cup to look in it rather violently um, with regard to how much fluid was actually in there, and I spilled coffee on my desk. It's what I get. It's totally what I get. I thought it was, I thought it was going to be less than that, but I was wrong. Okay, so Ignacio says, how might the concept of harmony be considered mathematical? Because harmony is good, true, and beautiful, is, is, in a sense, mathematical. Catherine found crackers. Yeah, Catherine? Shall we, you want to unmute and maybe see if the revolution has abated for a minute. Harmony is fulfilling, like doing nice. Okay, so can can you um, hear me better now? Hear you? I, I could hear you fine before. It's just that I could hear other things going on. I don't hear so much cacophony okay. right now. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So my answer was because to create harmony, you have to mathematically. Well, this is kind of, yeah, like mathematically think of like the quantity of intervals and how you want your melody to line up when you're actually like composing music or analyzing and it. There's fixed values for what makes a harmonic ratio, right? Ignacio says yes. You mean it's not just a matter of my own interpretation? Come on, don't tell me that that don't tell me that beauty is a mathematical thing. I'm going to get really offended at you because everybody knows that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? What's beautiful for you may not be beautiful for me and so forth. So I can play two notes on the piano that sound like really bad to you, but I like I, they're beautiful to me. Um I would argue against that. I would say no. At some level, harmony and beauty is mathematical. So, in a some sense, 
you, we can objectively say that that's not beautiful music because it doesn't follow harmonic ratios. Somebody, somebody said one time, I forget who it was, but I picked up on it. So I don't, I don't think this quote came from me, but I don't know who to attribute it to. Beauty isn't relative. It's just that some people prefer ugliness. Oh, dang it, if that isn't true. Oh my goodness. At some at some level, beauty is subjective, so don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the full measure of beauty is all mathematical. Like, here's the formula for beauty. But, but there is something in there. There is something in there. Something in there. It's hard to root itself out. No, beauty is not just a matter of one's own subjective emotional opinion. Beauty is at some level objective. And it's not that people find just anything beautiful. It's that there is true beauty and there is true ugliness. And some people prefer the ugliness. And that tells us about the nature of their soul and maybe even our own soul. Are there times when you and I prefer ugliness? Yeah. But we don't like to say that. We don't like to say, I like ugly. <laughs> what we say is, no, it's beautiful to me. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. See, we know that there's some. We know that there's some. We know that there's something wrong with that. <laughs> we try to cover it with the language. Catherine's internet is failing her. Well, maybe you got to go back into the war zone. No. <laughs> I got to get on to the next page. We only got ten minutes left. Here's what I wrote. Here's what I wrote. I said, harmony is pleasing. Harmony is a pleasing relationship. Here we go. I even wrote it in my own handwriting. Harmony is a pleasing relationship between notes, which can be described mathematically. It's the relationship between different quantities. So it's the numerical relationship that leads to beauty or can lead to beauty. By the way, do you know about the Fibonacci sequence? This is a whole can of worms. Do you know about the Fibonacci sequence? Do you know about the golden ratio? Do you know about the golden rectangle? You know about those things? Oh, maybe we need to do another seminar and do it on the, on do it on Fibonacci and the golden ratio. Oh yes, oh yes, the Fibonacci Fibonacci sequence: one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one. How do you get the next number? You get the next number by adding the two previous ones, right? So what's 13 and 21 added together? 34. If you start to take these numbers and do a ratio of them, 34 to 21, it starts to approximate 1.618, which is called the golden ratio, which is phi, which is how human beings have been programmed to find beautiful... Who's doing the programming? By the way, Fibonacci numbers are all over nature. It's almost like it's like a, the thumbprint of God. Okay, monocots and dicots, flowers in the patterns of three petals or five petals. Am I right or am I right? Mmm. Did you know that there's there's something with the spirals on pineapples? Like if you look at a pineapple, it's got like little chunks. No, there's a spiral clockwise, and then there's another spiral counterclockwise. I think it's in in a five and a thirteen pattern or something like that. If you take a banana and you cut it in in like in 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 half crossways, and you look at the at the cross section, it's set up in threes. You can stick your finger down the middle and break it off into three different parts. Three. Do you guys know that the way leaves arrange themselves on um, plants are set up in multiples of three, five, eight, thirteen, so forth. And it's a clockwise twisting or it's a counterclockwise twisting. Reed says wrong. Oh what have I what did I say that was wrong? Oh he says just kidding. Wow. Reed prefers chaos to order. <laughs> but don't tell me chaos is order. Oh no, that's different. <laughs> just trolling you right back. 
you you know the you know the um the Vitruvian Man, Vitruvian Man is Da Vinci's thing where he took like um, like the person, and did like something. What did he do? There there's something with the arms outstretched. There's the circle, and with the legs down, is some something like that. You know they know that thing. It's all in it's all in it's all on Fibonacci proportions. The human body is proportional to this. Hmm. Holy smoke, six minutes. All right, back page. Back page. I'm just going to do the answers now. I'll let you read it on your own. They're in there. The Pythagorean philosopher Adrosides says the mathematical arts should be studied because why? B? Yeah, they help us gain wisdom. How would how would modern students in a mathematical class what do they what would they think they would be the right answer? Probably this one. You should study math so you can build cities. Mathematics is a job skill. You're gonna need 21st century skills, don't you know? STEM is the only subjects that matter, like science, technology, engineering, and math. Ha 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 ha. We need to we need to use math in our jobs. Somebody else down here would go like, what in the world? Math helps you create painting? Actually, it would. If you look at School of Athens or some of the other um, like classic paintings, it's got proportions all over the place. If you've never done like perspective in art class, like you haven't been educated in art. Paint by number. <laughs> this is rare. I have to give you a witty comment, but boo on that idea. <laughs> number well I guess you got to start someplace that was well played thank you Lucy that's I'm gonna be driving home from school today still laughing about that all right so Plato's metaphor of a ladder is used to argue that mathematical arts like the high school the typical high school student would say oh yeah help us build ladders and bridges to physically take us places we can't easily no Carry your mind up from things that we can easily see and touch higher abstract truths and reason. Ptolemy said this. Ptolemy said that mathematics was the best science. Why is that? Because it's the divine world and then the physical world and then the mathematics is in the middle because the mathematics is seen in the physical world, but it's also seen in the divine world. And it, it, it's the bridge that brings us from the physical to think of the divine. We think of higher things through mathematics. Ptolemy. We should, I, I should pull out the I should pull out the seminar thing on Ptolemy. <laughs> okay, it's oh my goodness. We first start to learn about numbers by counting things like maybe even your fingers one two three four five if you count the thumb as a finger and so forth. But then you start to think about numbers abstractly, and the training in math trains your mind to think about abstract things, things that are not concrete and physical. And then that's the door into other abstract things like beauty and truth and justice and political harmony and things like that. None of those things are physical. For the students that say that only physical things exist, I say you must not believe in love then. Right? You don't believe in love? And then a student said, what is love? And I said, baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. <laughs> you don't get it? That, that, was, that was a song back in the 90s. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. Does Socrates think that the mathematical sciences should be studied for practical uses? Absolutely not. Why? Because of this. Okay. Well, how does it go? 
somebody's talking with Socrates, the inculocutor, right? Says, hey, we should study mathematical sciences because of all of these things we can use it for. All of these, all of these things, all of these things. Socrates says, you amuse me. That is his way of saying, you make me laugh. Don't we have a modern statement that says something like that? Although we mod in the modern world, we say, don't. Don't make me laugh. It's the idea of mockery. Socrates is mocking this person because they say that we should study mathematics because of the uses we have for these things. Socrates says, don't make me laugh. You seem to fear that these are useless. Useless? What do you mean useless? He just gave you a whole list of what he uses them for. He says, that's not important at all. This is so good. Like I get goosebumps still even just reading this. The eye of the soul, blinded and buried by other pursuits, is rekindled and aroused again by these and these alone. What? Math. The mathematical arts. And it's better that this be saved. Oh, no. Time to go. Hang on. Got to turn it off. It's better that this be saved. What be saved? The eye of your soul. I had a redhead kid tell me one time, I don't have a soul. I said, liar. That this be saved than thousands of bodily eyes, for by it alone is the truth of the universe beheld. Socrates says it's better that you understand the beauty and truth of the universe with the eye of your soul than you be physically able to see. Let me ask you, would you rather be blind and be able to do mathematics or not be able to do mathematics and be physically able to see? Socrates says it's better that you be blind than be able to do mathematics. Explain what Socrates meant by the phrase eye of the soul and why it claims it's more important than a physical eye. It goes back to what's real. If all you have is a physical eye, you don't, you don't have access to ultimate reality. The mind, the mind or the eye of the soul is developed by mathematics. That's why everybody should take it. On the back, summarize, include a description of the four mathematical arts, why Nicomachus believe they should be studied. All right. Time's up. This is so good stuff. I, I never had this in school. Nobody ever made me read Nicomachus. Um, do your best. Turn it in. And um, have a merry, merry Christmas.